Hey there, magical souls. Ready for a bewitching date night with Gretchen? You're in for a treat? Welcome back to my channel, your go-to spot for fantastical tales. Today, we're stepping into the enchanting world of Halloween Date Night, episode 6 in the Gretchen's Misadventures series by P.A. Mason. In this spooktacular tale, join us as we follow Gretchen on another misadventure, where Halloween magic and mysterious encounters await. So grab your broomstick, a sprinkle of excitement, and let's uncover the spellbinding delights of Halloween date night. Halloween date night. Chapter one. This is the biggest pile of dung this newspaper ever committed to print. Gretchen flicked the paper in disgust. A wicked witch put the fair young lady under her enchantment. Nora shrugged, not looking up from her pages of the paper. The Baron figured it would add to my infamy, and King Edgar just wanted to put the whole nasty business behind him. I can't believe that twerp welcomed the scribe back with open arms. Do they really think the public will buy this? They already have, Nora swirled the last of her ale and gulped it down. Queen Edwina is back on the throne, and the fair lady in question is supposedly recovering in a convent. The people of Exdor are suitably fearful of the witch from Helgard, and all is right in our kingdom. I can't believe you're not mad about this. What about us downtrodden witches? You're always yammering on about rights and fair pay. I'm lucky to have my position back at all, Nora snapped. And I myself never want to think about that bloody mirror again. Gretchen held her hands up. Fine. Okay. I mean, none of it was your fault is all I'm saying. Can't a witch stick up for her buddy? I don't see why you dislike him so much. The scribe? Gretchen screwed her face up. He peddles in lies and propaganda paints us as evil. Nora puffed out her cheeks and shook her head, not bothering to reply. Gretchen worried about her. Since they'd bundled her home and she'd stopped having compulsion withdrawal shakes, she hadn't been herself. Maybe it was the shame of becoming spellbound, or having her position threatened. Either way, Gretchen wanted the witch with sass back. Last drinks, Jürgen called from the bar. Gretchen swivelled in her seat with a groan, one chorused by the ogres involved in a dice game with a party of wood elves. Jürgen wore a stony expression and carried out a jug of ale to thump on the table in front of Nora. You've got to be kidding me! It's mid-afternoon for Pete's sake! Gretchen caught Jürgen's apron before he could amble off. I'm taking no chances. This will be the first place they hit, and the only night they can land a punch on the ogres. I have windows to board up and traps to set. He yanked his grubby apron free and strode back to the bar. Well, I suppose I don't want to be caught up in that either, Nora clucked. I'll be on my way. There are wards to be seen to at the estate. The Baron won't be pleased if they give out tonight of all nights. Gretchen's lip curled as her friend folded her paper and stood, pushing her spectacles up the bridge of her nose. She couldn't remember Nora ever giving a fat froggy's bottom about whether the domestic magic was in order. Usually she spoke like that kind of thing was beneath her. Gretchen hoped this wasn't a portent for a permanent shift of attitude. Rightio then, see you next time. Gretchen poured herself another ale and turned to consider the rest of the taproom at the Sultan Bog. She thought it odd that the ghostly folk hadn't turned up already to pop into their corporeal forms when the sun went down. Gretchen figured they were probably off plotting what kind of Halloween pranks they would pull. It made sense Jürgen would want to shut shop but sundown was hours away yet. The one night a year, ghosts could drink regular beverages, eat physical food, and get their filthy mitts on everything. It was annoying that conditions were optimal for a bunch of spells too, and this year she was certain she had the summoning spell just right. She'd have closure. After the business in the fairy realm, she'd come to terms with the probability that her great aunt Esme was gone. Even if the spell didn't work, She'd promised herself she wouldn't take it as a sign she was alive. She couldn't keep living in hope of something so far removed from probability. Tell you what. Jürgen dropped onto a stool next to her and flicked a dishcloth over his shoulder. You can stay a while longer if you do your mumbo-jumbo on the perimeter. Wards. Gretchen said the word deliberately like she was talking to a small child. Magical wards. And how much are you prepared to pay for my services? I've got my own mumbo-jumbo to be getting on with at home. Jürgen snorted. It'll earn you a few extra brownie points for the next time you need me to save your scrawny backside. He'd been impossible for weeks, thinking he was the hero for smashing that mirror. 
when just hours before she'd smuggled him out of a dungeon. She rolled her eyes and leaned back in her chair. I will never live this down, will I? Should have left you there to rot. Yeah, yeah, and who would serve you drinks then? All right, Gretchen slapped her knees as she stood. Let me see what's in the pantry. Should have let me know sooner. Don't you keep everything with you? Jürgen nodded at her infinity pouch. Potions, sure, but herbs don't keep well in there without spoiling wards. I've lost too much stock trying to keep tabs on them. The wood elves called for more ale, and Jürgen stood with a grumble to sort them out. Gretchen showed herself round back and tried to remember what she'd left in the kitchen from the time when she'd moved in temporarily. Following her nose, she found regular herbs hanging up from the rafters of the pantry. Sage, dill and thyme. Those were good, but to make something to keep those tricksters out, she'd need some tansy. After rifling through the back of the tavern stores, she clucked in irritation. Maybe she'd stowed just a few sprigs away for a rainy day in her pouch. Putting on the kettle as she tracked back to the kitchen table with her bundles, she settled on the bench seat and unhooked her pouch. She had to reach in shoulder deep and felt around in what forgotten herbs remained, wrinkling her nose as she brushed mushy remains. She yanked out what she could and inspected the mess on the table. Never again, she muttered. I've a mind to see that elod and get an explanation. Vacuum, indeed. Most of the stock was ruined, though she found a single stalk of tansy that only looked a little spoiled. She hummed a tune as she fixed herself a cup of tea and set to bundling the herbs together just so. When the sounds from the taproom had dwindled to nothing, Jürgen came out to join her. Didn't want your ale. He held up a jug with a quirked eyebrow. Thou shalt not drink and spell, Gretchen gave a sardonic smile. Well, not usually anyhow. I prefer tea when I'm working. So what are your plans for tonight? Jürgen grabbed a stack of mugs and headed to the sink. Dancing naked under the moonlight, cavorting with demons. I wish, she chortled. If I could shake my naked body around without doing myself an injury, I'd have found the elixir of youth. Jürgen barked a laugh and Gretchen smirked as she worked. She'd sidestepped the question nicely. If she brought up Aunt Esme again, he'd have thrown something at her. It wasn't like she ranted all that often, maybe only when she was deep in her cups, but both he and Nora had made it plain they didn't want to hear any more conspiracy theories. What about you? Sitting in a dark tavern with sharp, pointy things within arm's reach. You know, I still can't get all the egg off the gutters from last year. I've run the ale down as much as I can in case they get in. Mark my words, though. If they set foot in here tonight, they're getting cut off. The ethereal liquor is getting pricey anyway. Gretchen shrugged and stood, stretching her back with a satisfying crack. Not my best work, but not bad with next to no notice. Better go get this mumbo-jumbo done. Jürgen snorted and kept washing the dishes. Letting herself out the back, Gretchen ignited the bundle with an incantation and circled around the double-storey tavern. She had to admit, Jürgen had put a lot of work into the place since he took it over. It may even pass for a respectable establishment to the unsuspecting traveller. Keeping her focus on the charm, she chanted a common protection ward, focusing on those with intent to harm, and waved the smoking bundle as she strode around. She did three circuits before the smouldering herbs lost their puff, and she brushed them in the grass to keep from burning anything down. She stuck what remained over the front door and fetched her broom from the rack. Good luck tonight, she called with a wave. Jürgen nodded from the window, and Gretchen sighed as she approached the track of dirt reserved for air arrivals and departures. She took a minute to limber up, stretching her sides and dropping into some squats before getting a good run-up. Her vehicle was a little frisky. It propelled almost out of her grip before she leaped into the air and Gretchen barely caught it under her rump. The flight home was uneventful and thankfully brief. She'd spent too much time over the last few weeks filling orders she'd missed, sometimes going back and forth from the city three times in one day to satiate disgruntled customers. If business kept up at that rate, she'd either need to move to the city or stop getting sidetracked on weird adventures. If only the adventures paid, Gretchen mused as she touched down in her garden. Nothing looked amiss, and she was confident the ghosts had nothing in store for her. Her place was too far out of the way and didn't have much that appealed to their fleshly appetites on their one night of indulgence. 
she'd heard in town that the mayor had been campaigning for weeks, threatening to make it illegal to hire the dead should Edgewater sustain any damage. She wasn't sure that would make any difference. Technically, ghosts needed nothing to survive, and it was only the lure of what passed for ghost booze that had them working odd jobs. Scaring birds away from fields, land surveying and sometimes scouting or surveillance. Gretchen's mind drifted as she scraped her boots by the door, a strange kind of melancholy tugging at her soul. Everything was in readiness for tonight's summoning. All she had to do was wait until the moon was high overhead. But she didn't want to think about the prospect of coming up with nothing again. Or worse, snuffing out what tiny kernel of hope she had of her aunt's return. Mulligan, at least, was happy to see her, and she gave the purple feline a scratch as he jumped on the back of the sofa. He could always tell when she was glum, but she suspected his purrs had more to do with an empty belly. Yeah, all right. Just let me get to the kitchen, bossy boots. After putting a kettle on to boil and rustling up some gizzards, Gretchen pulled her chair a little closer to the fire and sat with her feet propped. She reached for the latest edition of The Witch's Digest, a subscription she'd never gotten around to cancelling, and opened it with a sense of nostalgia. It always was Aunt Esme's favourite, and she had a whole musty stack of them in the spare room. At least the scribe of the realm's drivel wasn't among the pages, though some articles were snoozeworthy. She skipped past How to Keep Your Cauldron Shining, and groaned at the five hacks to keep your herbs from spoiling. She finally settled on the crossword at the back and reached for the stubby pencil she kept for the task. The warmth from the hearth spread over her, and it wasn't long before her eyes drooped, wondering what in tarnation a Tannenbaum dangler was. Chapter 2 Excuse me. Gretchen's eyes flew open, and she stared at the ghost hovering in front of her. She leapt out of her chair, reached for her fire poker, and instead burned her hand in the hearth. Who the heck are you? She cradled her hand with a wince. Waking up a poor woman in her own home. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, your type. She blinked, then looked at the darkened window. I, um, couldn't knock. His eyes darted and he wrung his hands together. But you should be... Embodied, I know, that's why I'm here. The initial shock faded, and the sting on her hand became more apparent. With a hiss, she stepped to her sink and plunged her hand in under the faucet, muttering at the pump to bring water up from the bore under her cottage. Bring me my pouch, will... She shook her head. Or don't. I'm sorry to disturb you. My name is Ed. I didn't know where else to go. Gretchen narrowed her eyes at the ghost, trying to place his face. You don't look familiar, not from around these parts. She pulled her hand from the water and fumbled with her pouch ties to locate some burn salve. Close enough, he coughed. I don't frequent places like the salt and bog. Gretchen arched her eyebrow at the implication. Smoothing salve over her hand, she dropped to a stool and wrapped a clean bandage around it. So what's the problem then? If you're not the hooligan type, what do you need a body for? assuming I could do anything about that kind of problem. His face coloured, as much as it was possible, given his transparent nature. It's, well, my wife and I. You're married? Gretchen's nose wrinkled. Who marries a dead guy? She's in the same condition. He set his jaw and folded his arms. Can you help me or not? Oh. Gretchen fought a smirk and rubbed the bridge of her nose. So she's... Ah, uh, expecting you to be solid tonight, huh? She leaned forward and chuckled. I'm glad you think it's funny, he huffed. We have one night a year to enjoy a meal, glass of wine, and share our love. Gretchen took a moment to school her face to composure and sat up with a smirk. It's just, well, I mean, you're not the first guy to come calling when all isn't right in the boudoir. But dang, this one has to be the pick of the bunch. Is there any remedy? Sheesh, you're asking me. Keep the lighting romantic and smuggle in something to get the job done. Gretchen blinked. Oh, you mean magic you a body? Smuggling in your condition wouldn't work anyhow. Well? He drifted back and forth in her kitchen in an approximation of pacing. Can't say as I've ever tried. If your lady friend... I haven't seen my wife all day. I work over at the mill, making sure the mechanisms don't get clogged. But there was a problem with the water flow upriver, so I was sent to check on it. 
Sounds riveting. Gretchen smacked her lips together. Tell you what, I'll take a gander in my spell book, but I don't like your chances. I've got my own business to be about and don't have time to be looking for a solution until dawn. He muttered his thanks and Gretchen stood, craning her head at the window to check the moon's position. Her summoning ritual was still hours off yet and her spell book had been surprisingly insightful lately. She rarely fetched her book from its hiding spot with witnesses around, but reasoned that he was incapable of stealing it and too anxious to pay it much mind. She ignored him as he drifted around the cottage and folded the rug back in her living room. Her spell book shuddered as she carried it to her desk, and she ran a reassuring hand over its weathered leather bindings. Magic was potent on Halloween night, and her book was picking up on the vibe. So, um... Gretchen cleared her throat. How old are you? Posthumous, I mean. Ed came to a halt by the hearth and blinked. My wife and I died 73 years ago. Gretchen set her book down with a frown. But does that mean she was your wife before you died? Of course. Ed looked confused. I don't recall ever hearing of ghosts getting married. No, I suppose not. Gretchen rubbed her chin. Though it's pretty rotten luck, if you ask me. Both of you drifting here for goodness knows how long. I mean, till death do you part, just got a whole lot longer. We get to stay together, Ed looked affronted. Better than those other wretches who don't pass on. If you say so. Gretchen shrugged and undid the laces of her spell book. Crooning as she opened its cover, she smoothed over the pages and tried for a gentle voice. Rough night, I know, but we have Ed here who has a little trouble firming up for his date night. The spell book gave a small jolt and a potion recipe appeared, its letters quivering. Gretchen's cheeks burned as she recognised its intended purpose and twisted her lips in a wry smile. No, no, nothing like that, a ghost who didn't materialise properly. The pages coloured a rosy pink before the letters blinked off the page and an inky swirl churned. She smacked her lips and shrugged at Ed. Doesn't come with waiting music, I'm afraid. The tome hummed and didn't look like coming up with anything soon. So Gretchen turned back to the kitchen to put on a fresh pot of tea. I'm guessing this won't be easy, and I don't really dabble in magic beyond the grave. But if we try to follow some kind of logic... She stretched her neck from side to side. How did you and your wife expire? Ed settled on the sofa with a sigh, though Gretchen imagined it was habit rather than putting his feet up. We operated the mill back then, Bess and me. There was an outbreak of plague that year. Gretchen felt a twinge in her gut at the mention of plague and was grateful she hadn't lived through a major plague event. The localised flare-ups that happened from time to time were treated more seriously than they used to be and the Witches' Guild held funds to keep a store of medicines to distribute in times of crisis. Gretchen had only been on a response crew once and hoped she wouldn't have to see that kind of suffering again. She opened her mouth but clicked her teeth shut when her spell book made a popping noise. The request must have confused it, because instead, if individual spells, the book had filled with undead lore and rituals, she flicked through the pages with a sigh and took a sip of tea. She halted on a particular section and squinted at a passage that read like a textbook on ghosts, wondering absently which of her ancestors had such an interest in the topic. On the matter of souls trapped in this world post-death, little is known about their afterlife constraints. Some theorise that they have unfinished business to attend or emotional trauma too great to overcome. There is insufficient record-keeping to establish, on average, how long they tarry in this world. But the phenomena of their transformation on Hallow's Eve night warrants further exploration. Gretchen rolled her eyes and turned the page, searching for something more substantial. That wasn't the first time she had come across essays rather than spells in her book, and if she could have them scrubbed from the enchantment, she would. They were rarely useful and always stuffy. The next ritual looked promising, if perhaps a little broad, and she turned a shrewd look to Ed. There's something here to summon a zombie. There's a chance it might rip your corpse out of the ground, but if I change a little of the intent, it might give your essence a little nudge in the right direction. Ed swallowed, and Gretchen quirked an eyebrow. I'll try anything. He chewed his lip. I don't want to let her down. Gretchen shrugged and headed to her pantry to round up some herbs and a mortar and pestle. 
The ritual itself didn't call for a potion of any kind, and she was keen to get Ed out the door so she could get in the zone for her proper summoning later tonight. She ground up bay leaves and birch and added them to a pot of salt with a few drops of nightshade oil. She breathed deep, clearing her mind, and carried the mixture to a bare spot on her timber floors. She muttered an incantation as she trailed a circle, and as the ends of the concoction met, a vapour rose, stealing warmth from the air of her cosy cottage. She breathed in deep, vaguely surprised at its potency, even as her mind reached a place of spellbound calm. You need to step in, Gretchen said, waving a hand to Ed. He eyed the circle warily but hesitated only a moment before drifting in. As he crossed the line, blue flames leaped up and he yelped in surprise. Gretchen settled herself on the floor in front of him and closed her eyes to focus. She concentrated on her intent to give Ed a corporeal form and felt a crawling over her skin as she swayed gently with an unvoiced tune. There was a sense of panic pushed far away to the back of her mind as her witch self completed the ritual chanting words unfamiliar to her lips and summoned as if from the ether. A flash of pain brought her back to her right mind, and she gasped as she scrambled back from the salt circle. Inside, Ed doubled over, clutching his stomach, but on account of still seeing right through him, she knew the spell had failed. Well, that was way too creepy, Gretchen hugged her arms with a wince. I knew I kept away from that kind of magic for a reason. Ed, you okay in there? The ghost drifted over the now smoking line of the circle with a groan and lifted his head to meet her eye. I thought you were joking when you said it would bring my corpse from the ground. Gretchen's eyes bugged out. I was. Well, I can feel it, he grimaced, and it's none too happy about being exhumed either. Chapter 3 Gretchen pushed herself to her feet with a curse and promised to summon whichever ancestor of hers responsible for recording the ritual in her spell book. She had a few choice words for them, and she didn't care if they were beyond the grave. Ed's breathing, or at least his mimicking of breathing, was laboured, and he remained hunched over with a hand to his belly. Gretchen stomped back over to her spell book and glared down at the page. She couldn't find mention of a dispel ritual, though it referenced that the summoning would fail with Dawn's arrival. Fiddlesticks, Gretchen seethed. Of all the nights for something like this to happen, it could have just not worked, same as usual. She scrubbed a hand over her face and flipped the pages, scanning for something useful. Where you buried, Ed? She looked over her shoulder, hoping she hadn't done permanent damage. For a ghost, he was a polite type. Out back of the mill, he grunted. Wasn't enough time for a decent burial at a church. It figured, Gretchen thought. The priority for those with something catching was to get them underground as quickly as... Bess! came Ed's strangled cry. She's at the mill! Gretchen's eyes widened, and she stared back down at the spell book. Her eyes fixed on the words, Ginura Orantiaca, and she slammed the book shut. Closing her eyes, she rubbed the bridge of her nose, trying to reckon with the damage a lone zombie could do in one night. We have to save her! Ed drifted closer, his face twisted in pain. The dead eating the dead, Gretchen tittered. What is this world coming to? Come on, you can ride with me. Gretchen made a stop by her pantry to fetch a small vial of oil and tucked it in her pouch. With a nod, she stowed her spell book away and swung a cloak over her shoulders before striding out the door. Ed managed well enough, and once she got her broom in the air, he hovered along in its wake likely hitching a ride in the air current. The mill was on the other side of Edgewater, closer to the farms that dealt in grains by the Solar River. She didn't drift close enough to see if the other ghosts were unleashing havoc in the township, but hoped they were otherwise occupied while she was out on her travels. She'd played her fair share of pranks in the salt and bog while they were around, and didn't want to give them an opportunity to score a point on her. The mill itself sat apart from any other buildings of industry, and as Gretchen touched down in the yard, thankfully rolling onto an accommodating pile of straw, she was relieved all seemed quiet. At least from the outside. She left the broom on the ground and trotted over to the red-painted door to the warehouse. Not there, Ed called, pointing. Up on the crank floor. 
Gretchen's ears pricked at the sound of jeering and she cast around for any assailants. The sound didn't escape Ed either, whose face blanched at the noise. Despite his apparent discomfort, he flew off and disappeared into the upper levels. Grumbling, Gretchen located the door on the side of the stone building and blinked at the latch, which looked like someone had ripped it clear off. She pushed the door open and fetched out the vial, waiting for Ed's earthly remains to spring out at her. When she heard a raucous laugh, she frowned and stuck her head through the door. Certain zombies didn't have a sense of humour. The glow of lantern fire came from up the stairs and a familiar voice rang out. Oh, come on, you two are such party poopers. Stay holed up in that room every year like you're too good for the likes of us. Reginald, one of her least favourite ghosts from the tavern. Curling her lip, she climbed the stairs, prepared to give the ruffian a piece of her mind. When a howling sounded in the distance, she hiked up her skirts and ran up the stairs two at a time. Get out of here, the lot of you, and let us enjoy our night in peace. Ed's voice was strained. Gretchen cleared the last landing, sucking air in laboured breaths, and a cohort of five men in clothes a century out of style swung around to greet her. Their eyes lit up at the sight of her, and she stabbed her finger down the stairs to alert them. Zombie, she gasped, heading this way. The statement only brought a round of drunken laughter, and Reginald pushed past the others to scoop Gretchen into his arms. He swung her around in a dance, his body pressed up against her, while the others squalled a bawdy bar song. Come now, Gretchen, Reginald leered, whiskey heavy on his breath. What say you and me tonight? Just the two of us, like those lovebirds in there. Gretchen thrust him away as she recoiled and leaned against the rough-sawn walls. Over my dead body? Now? Oh, Reginald pouted, leaning toward her in the confines of the stairwell. You'd make me wait that long. Can't say I'm going anywhere any time soon, but even so. Shut up, you lecherous fool, Gretchen snapped. I summoned a zombie, and if you lot don't sober up, it'll chew your face off any minute. His face went slack as he considered her words, and he turned to lean over the railing. I don't see any zombies. Well, it won't be long before it smells live flesh in here. She frowned at the bolted door behind the peanut gallery. You okay in there, Ed? Fine, though he didn't sound it but matters just became a little complicated. Gretchen quirked an eyebrow as he drifted through the door, hand in hand with who could only be Bess, her ghostly eyes wary as she shrank away from the other hooligans. Now that's interesting. Perhaps if you hadn't come to see me first. A strangled howl came from downstairs and Gretchen's heart leapt in her chest. She swallowed, her mind reeling, and pushed Reginald ahead of her as she trod down the steps. Come on, boys. About time you did something useful. She glanced over her shoulder at the four who looked sobered at least, but weren't moving to help. Don't be cowards now. Just need to hold it down so I can douse it. You don't want to take it on in close confines now, do you? She turned the vial in her sweaty palm, hoping it would work. She hadn't read the passage properly, given the urgency, and hadn't thought through any kind of plan B. Carl took the first step, and then came Murray, if not looking eager, at least reconciled. That away, guys. Get this done and I'll dust off one of my top-shelf witch's brews. That brought a cheer, and Gretchen cursed herself for offering. A picture formed in her mind of her cottage playing host to a rowdy party, and she knew the lads would hold her to her word. But how would she get to her own summoning ritual? What was that? Reginald hissed, stopping short. Did you hear that? Keep going, Buster. You won't miss a zombie coming. They rounded the last platform and looked out over hessian sacks piled up against the stone walls. All looked quiet, but every shadow seemed sinister. Gretchen had to remind herself that zombies didn't have the wit to hide from danger. She glanced up at Bess, who was hovering above their party, and pointed. Go and take a gander, will you? There's nothing on those bones that a zombie will find appetising. Bess's eyes were round as dinner plates, but she gave a nod and passed through the wall behind them. Ed hadn't followed them down the stairs, and Gretchen worried at the effect his proximity to his earthly remains was having. The sound of breathing in the darkened space was deafening, and Gretchen reached for a couple of light charms in her pouch. Igniting them with an incantation, she tossed them out to the floor, cushioned by piles of straw. With a nod to the rest of the crew, she pushed past Reginald and stepped off the staircase. 
Her boot heels echoed on the bare timber floor, and she was wondering where Bess had gotten to when she drifted in through the wall. She wrung her ethereal hands, her face a mask of horror. It's out there, circling the mill. I don't think it's found the door. Being the... Gretchen rolled her eyes. They're not exactly known for their intelligence. Technically, its brains are upstairs. She jerked a thumb toward the stairs, and the corporeal ghosts shared a look of surprise. You animated Ed's corpse! Carl barked a laugh. This is the craziest Halloween I've ever unlived through. What's with you two anyway? Reginald frowned at Bess. Can't say as I've ever seen a ghost on Hallow's Eve, let alone two. I don't know. Bess hugged her arms. I just didn't. As for Ed, I was wondering where he got to. He usually... Gretchen held her arm up to silence them as she saw a shadow pass the door. It was being awfully quiet for the undead sort, though after being underground for 70 years, she wasn't sure what kind of shape the body would be in. Of course, after lending strength to it through the ritual, she didn't want to underestimate it. Right, I've only got one shot at this, and I can't just hope this oil splashes in the right spot. One of you needs to get on the other side of that doorway and push it in next time it stumbles past. The men each lifted a finger to point at another, and Gretchen puffed out her cheeks. We shouldn't spend the one night a year we enjoy the pleasures of the flesh to get a bite taken out of us. Reginald folded his arms in front of him. You raised it. You deal with it. You won't even need that flesh tomorrow, you big scaredy cat. Get your backside out there or I'll make it my business to tell all the ogres at the salt and bog that a zombie had you shaking in your boots. He scowled at that and the others snickered. Gretchen held her hands to her hips, waiting, and after a moment he sighed and turned toward the door. Gretchen waved for silence again and when a flash went past the door, she heard a gurgling whine from its general direction. Can you smell that? Carl held a sleeve to his nose. I thought I was imagining it, but that was definitely... Rotten flesh. Comes with the territory. Gretchen grabbed Reginald by the elbow and pushed him out the door. Now, you lot on each side of the door. I'll need you to catch it so I can put every drop to good use. She held the vial up, checking for any sign of cloudiness, and popped off the cork. She held it up to her nose with a wince, and Bess floated a little closer. What's that? she asked commonly known as the purple velvet plant. She wrinkled her nose. With flowers that stink. I don't grow them myself, but I got a little essence a while back. Comes in useful for a... Well, never mind. Turning, she fixed the corporeal ghosts with a stern stare and pushed up her sleeves. Murray, who she'd always thought had more brains than the rest of them, had grabbed a few coils of rope hung on the wall and Carl brandished an empty bottle. Gretchen sucked in a deep breath through her mouth and widened her stance. Now, she whispered, we'll all be just fine if we remember to watch out for the teeth. Seconds dragged on, while the animated corpse did his circuit of the mill, and Gretchen felt bile creep up from her belly. She never cared much for dead things, and moving dead things even less. In the deafening silence, she heard a shuffling approach and bent her knees ready to pounce. As the shadow emerged, she heard Reginald grunt as he shoved it inside, and the rotten corpse yowled as the others grabbed at it. Gretchen readied her vial, holding back until she could be sure it would hit the mark, then recoiled in horror as its arms fell away. It lurched toward her, teeth gnashing, its eye sockets empty. Chapter 4 Ah! Gretchen stepped backwards and fell over a sack. Get a hold of that thing, will you? In her periphery, she saw an arm crawl past on its fingers, and as the zombie leaned over, someone threw a rope over its head. Gretchen curled her lip as its head popped from its shoulders and squealed when it dropped on her belly. She grabbed it and teeth gnashed at her sleeve, but she managed to hurl it across the room. The sacks, Murray called. Gretchen scrambled to sit up and watched as the ghosts collected the fallen limbs. Carl stood over the head apparently too wary to pick it up, and Reginald threw an empty sack over it before hooking it up and holding it up at arm's length. Gretchen drew ragged gasps and considered the legs and torso on the floor, flailing around hopelessly. That, Reginald snarled, is one of the most offensive odours I've ever come across. Gretchen stood and held a sleeve to her mouth. Well, if it's any consolation, I'm sure your corpse is somewhere smelling just as bad. How do you make it stop? 
Alfred, the smallest of the crew, had climbed some crates and looked a sickly shade of green. Smash its brains to bits! Reginald reached for a hammer. Only way to put them down for good! No, you don't. Gretchen held a hand up. I've had just about enough defiling of the dead for one night. Reginald waggled his eyebrows. You can defile me any time you like. It was too much for Gretchen, who stumbled to the door. I think I'm going to barf. Howls of laughter from the other ghosts accompanied jeering from Reginald, and Gretchen crossed the threshold, the cool air on her clammy face welcome. She leaned against the stone wall and emptied what she thought was a week's worth of food from her stomach. When she finished dry heaving, she took a couple of deep breaths and strode back into the mill. Right, let's get this mess in a pile. Murray stuffed both arms in with the head and Carl wound a rope around the legs. Gretchen dropped the bag on the torso and opened it just enough to tip the purple velvet in, saving the last few drops for the body. She waited as the zombies' twitches slowed and her shoulders sagged in relief as they came to a stop. Bess, she glanced up at the ghost who had been loitering up in the rafters. Do be a dear and go check on your husband, I'm hoping this has helped. Bess disappeared into the upper levels and Gretchen cleared her throat. I... ah, uh, thanks fellas. Couldn't have got this done without you. You're welcome, Carl nodded. Now what's this you said about witches brew? Gretchen puffed out her cheeks. They'd earned it, but she was wondering if she had time to do her own summoning now. Part of her wanted to swing past home and drop a bottle off to them at the mill, but a weight of guilt had settled in her gut, and she worried about Ed. First things first, I don't know how long that corpse will stay down, and we don't want some poor unsuspecting soul to find it, never mind the damage. If they find out it was me who raised it, the sheriff will throw the full weight of the law at me. Murray and Carl snickered, and Reginald rubbed his chin. We bury it, he said. It won't dig itself out without any arms. I wouldn't be so sure, Gretchen chewed her lip, and leaving my handiwork behind doesn't sit well with me. I won't be able to get it on my broom. Us? Reginald jerked his thumb at his companions. You want us to smuggle that to your place? One bottle ain't worth it, Alfred muttered from atop the crate. Fellas, Gretchen spread her hands with a smile. There isn't a single drinking establishment open tonight, so unless you want to get yourselves arrested for breaking in somewhere... I'm your best bet. Or get arrested for grave robbing. Murray folded his arms in front of him. Bess and Ed drifted down through the ceiling and came face to face with Gretchen. Ed seemed improved, and he swallowed as he stared at his remains. So, it's done? I'd say the worst of it, but time will tell. Once morning comes, it should be safe to put back in the ground. Gretchen studied his face. Feeling better? A bit of a headache. He scrubbed a hand through his wisps of hair. But it's a big improvement. The couple floated together arm in arm, and Gretchen wondered at their particular ailment. The least she could do was take another look at her spell book and read the darn thing properly. How's about you all come back to my place? Plenty of witches brew for you lot. She nodded at the corporeal ghosts, then looked at Ed and Bess. And maybe I can figure out what's up with you two. I promise I won't try the first spell in the book. The couple shared a glance, and Bess shrugged, the others cheered at the mention of alcohol, and Ed gave her a nod. I'm sorry, I know you had other plans tonight. Not your fault I have a proclivity to improvise, she winked. My teachers always told me I'd blow myself up before graduating. Reginald coughed and nudged the trust corpse with a boot. So, any ideas on how we're supposed to get a dead body through town tonight? Of all nights? The sheriff issued a warning and is mustering the town watch. Gretchen rolled her eyes and huffed. It was their pranks which had warranted the tight security. Cleaning up Edgewater had taken an entire week last year. We can scout. Ed drifted around the mill. And there's a handcart around the back. Murray and Carl took that as a cue and strode out to fetch it. Ted and Alfred folded the torso over the legs to get it into another sack, and once the cart was loaded, Reginald dropped a bag of wheat on top for good measure. Still stinks, though. Reginald wrinkled his nose. Gretchen clucked her tongue and reached in her pouch for something useful. She usually kept a bottle or two of foot de tonic. It sold well in the city, which she hoped would be strong enough to take on the stench of decades-old decay. She gave the bottle a sniff. This month she'd opted for a minty scent and waved Reginald to move the grain out of the way. 
You lot could do with a dose of this yourselves. Her mouth twisted in a wry smile. I mean, one night a year to enjoy your bodies and you don't bother with a bath. Reginald gave his armpit a sniff and Murray waved the lapels of his jacket. Gretchen surmised they had met their ends reeking and the Halloween enchantment only revived their stenchly state. They decided on skirting the town around the river and cutting through the buildings of industry on the way to Gretchen's cottage. Bess and Ed agreed to go ahead and take turns bringing back intel, then drifted off through the walls as Murray pushed the cart out into the night. Gretchen retrieved her broom from where she left it, and as she dusted it off, Reginald pointed his finger at her. Don't you be thinking you can scoot off on that stick without us. If we get caught with this mess, I'm shifting the blame squarely on you. Pa! Gretchen pushed the broom into her pouch. And here I was, thinking you were trying to woo me. You should brush up on your chivalry, if you hope to charm a lady next year. That brought hearty agreement from the others, and they set off over the bridge and away from the mill. The torches the others brought with them had doused, so Gretchen handed out light charms to illuminate the way. It was risky. Gretchen didn't want to bring any undue attention to their party, but twisting her ankle as they went cross-country didn't appeal either. Thankfully, the zombie incident had sobered the ruffians, and on the trip, she learned more about them than she'd ever known in the years they had frequented the Salt and Bog. Most of them had attempted to cross over in one way or another, and wild rumours abounded in their community about different methods to achieve a proper death. From acting as a guardian angel to their descendants, right through to exacting justice on their enemies, they'd tried it all in the morose moments when existence became too much. So, have any of you heard of ghosts who haven't, ah, uh, solidified on Halloween? Gretchen grimaced as she stepped into a muddy puddle. Never in my time. Alfred was the oldest of them, having died over a century ago. As regular as clockwork every year, but come morning, they're folks who aren't accounted for. We figure they passed on. On Halloween? Gretchen pressed her lips together. Makes sense. Does it happen other times of year? Sure, Murray looked over his shoulder from the cart. But usually at times of festivities. Christmas, the midsummer solstice, that kind of thing. Gretchen wondered if whoever had collated the information in her spellbook had hung out with many ghosts. From what she was hearing, the notion of unfinished business stood out as a likely contender for ending their ghostly sentence. Whatever it is, I'll have a dose. Carl pointed at the buildings ahead. I've spent the better part of a decade watching the dye house to make sure linen isn't dipped too long, about as riveting as watching grass grow. You'll do plenty of that at Farmer McBride's place, Ted huffed. The birds soon learn to keep off the fields and seek other pastures when you've been haunting them for years. You do that much? Gretchen asked. Haunting, I mean. More the domain of wraiths, Reginald's tone was bitter. With their la -di da magic, snuffing candles and making the crockery shake. Yeah, those guys are too big for their britches. There's this one who hangs out in a tower out in the woods. Tricked me right into a hole in the ground and... Gretchen's cheeks burned as she remembered what happened next. She didn't relish telling those guys about the burned backside she'd earned getting out of that situation. Go on, Reginald gave her a nudge with his elbow. Shh, Alfred held up a hand. Did you hear that? Hear what? Gretchen whispered, stopping short to scan the surroundings. The town was to their left, and they'd mostly passed the houses. Tall buildings loomed fifty feet away, but all looked quiet and she couldn't hear anything. There it goes again. Alfred waved them to crouch. Gretchen's ears strained to hear what he was talking about, but saw the orange glow of torchlight around a warehouse first. As a group of men marched into view, light glinted off a pitchfork and Gretchen groaned. Pitchforks, they're never good news. You lot, one of them called out. Stay right there. Their party stood, hands up, and glanced at one another as their assailants drew closer. Gretchen stared at the cart, its contents blessedly still, but she knew they would search it. She wondered idly what the punishment was for exhuming and defiling the dead was, and then decided she didn't want to know. Perhaps she wouldn't need to summon Aunt Esme. She could be with her in the afterlife before too long. What are you louts doing out here in the dead of night? Gretchen thought the one in front with the moustache might have been from the freight house, but she didn't recognise the other five. These boys are just helping me out. 
Gretchen smiled. Secret witch business and all that. Can't waste the magical energy on Halloween, you know, and... That one, Bill, one watchman pointed at Carl. He works at the Dye House. It's them. We aren't doing anything unlawful. Reginald thrust his chin in the air. We've not set foot in town, given how inhospitable it looks. What about Charlie's widow? Bill curled his lip. Dashed into town to sit with my wife after hearing scratching at her door. Reginald's face bloomed scarlet. Thought we were friends, is all. I've looked out for her vegetable patch all year. Gretchen rolled her eyes. If he'd been scratching at her door, she would have clouted him with a sturdy pan. What's in the cart? The watchman who'd ousted Carl pointed. Ah, uh, nothing. Witch supplies. Too heavy to carry on a broom, so I enlisted some help. Doing my good deed for the night, keeping Edgewater free from pranksters. Bill narrowed his eyes at Gretchen, and she swallowed. He waved to his comrades to search it, and Murray scuttled back from the handles with his hands up. Panic welled in Gretchen's gut, though she could think of nothing to get them out of this mess. The men rummaged through the cart, spilling the sack of wheat over the side, and one of them leapt back with a yelp. I think the sheriff will want to see this. Chapter 5. Creeping outside Edgewater, pushing a corpse around in a handcart. The sheriff shared a disgusted look among Gretchen and the corporeal ghosts. The magistrate will have a field day with this. Gretchen swallowed. She didn't want to consider what the outcome of a trial would be. Coming up with a plausible excuse escaped her, and she wondered where Ed and Bess had gotten to. Maybe if they backed her up, she'd have a leg to stand on. Well, good luck getting the charge to stick to all of us. Reginald folded his arms. I don't see how you could prove we had motive to want that mess dug up. He waved to the sack in the corner, sitting neatly on the rest of the body. Accomplices, then. The sheriff pressed his lips together. You're saying it was the witch who is responsible? Gretchen's eyes widened, and she stared pleadingly at Reginald. That admission may just be the last nail in the coffin. He had the decency to look abashed, but turned to the sheriff with a nod. The body was her doing. We were just conscripted into getting it back to her place. Oh, come on! Gretchen gave Reginald a sharp poke to the ribs. What's the worst a magistrate could do to the likes of you, huh? In case you forgot, you won't have a body come morning. Scared of a noose? or being held in a cell you could fly right out of. What do you have to say for yourself, Miss Mirkwood? The sheriff took a step toward her. The people of Edgewater will be in an uproar over this heinous crime. Gretchen glared at the ghost cohort and turned steely eyes to the sheriff. The body was at the old mill and after a slight mishap of mine decided to exhume itself. In the interests of Edgewater's citizens, I thought it best to get that mess back to my cottage where I can figure out how to put it back to death. Murderous intent? The sheriff's eyebrows climbed his forehead. Is that a confession? Gretchen's face screwed up and she held up a hand. Whoa, hold on there, buddy. Ain't nobody heard of murdering a corpse. If you prefer, I can just leave this guy here and wait until he gets frisky again. Rotten or no, those chompers are dangerous. The sheriff rubbed his chin and glanced at the handcart in the warehouse's corner. With a nod to one watchman, he pointed to a coil of rope. Secure it with whatever is lying around. So, seeing as she's confessed, Reginald ventured. You're not going anywhere, the sheriff snapped. Not until this case has been heard. The corporeal ghosts muttered and grumbled, and Reginald folded his arms in front of him. Well, we haven't got all night now, have we? The wide door to the warehouse creaked open, and a watchman poked his head through. The sheriff clapped his hands and an elderly man, still in his nightdress and cap, trod into the lantern light wearing a scowl. Your worship, the sheriff offered a slight bow. Apologies for rousing you at this hour, but as I'm sure my man informed you, grave robbing? The magistrate pushed a pair of spectacles up his nose and squinted at Gretchen and her companions. Forbidden arts of necromancy? Never in all my years have I dealt in such depravity. I shall have the lot of you hanged and be back to my bed in short order. Hanged? Gretchen reached for her throat and gasped. Don't you think that's a little premature, given you haven't been presented with the facts? The magistrate blinked and turned a questioning look to the sheriff, who waved at his men, manhandling the sack in the handcart. 
they dropped their ropes and wheeled it closer for the magistrate to inspect the remains. Gretchen hoped the head might have at least tried to snap the old man's fingers off to illustrate her point, but it seemed she would have no such luck. I would say the evidence is overwhelming, madam. The magistrate wrinkled his nose and waved for the cart to be taken away. Don't I get some kind of right of reply? A lawyer or something? Gretchen's mind raced. The magistrate rolled his eyes and sank to an accommodating barrel. Should you wish to have legal counsel? The matter would need to be adjourned until such time as that could be arranged. Perfect, Gretchen rubbed her hands together. You just tell me where and when and I'll be there. The sheriff snorted with laughter, and the magistrate gave Gretchen a level stare. You would remain in the sheriff's custody. Can't very well have a dangerous criminal on the loose in the good town of Edgewater now, can we? Gretchen clenched her eyes shut and fought for patience. All she'd wanted to do for Halloween was a quiet summoning under the moonlight of her garden. At the rate things were going, she would be lucky to get out of this calamity in one piece. What say you then? My patience is wearing thin. Gretchen blinked at the magistrate and clenched her fists at her sides. It was a shame they'd stripped her of her pouch. There were more than a few nasty surprises in there she would have dearly loved to unleash. I'll defend myself. Gretchen couldn't tell whether the gasps from her ghostly companions were of shock or relief that they may have a few hours left to enjoy their bodies after she was hanged. Either way, she knew she'd done nothing intentionally wrong and thought if she could explain herself properly, the magistrate may see reason. Best make it quick, then. The magistrate arched an eyebrow. Gretchen swallowed, searching for the right words, and stepped closer. Well, your worshipness, it was like this. A ghost called Ed came calling tonight, except he was still a ghost on account of not materialising properly. Has a lady friend back at the old mill and was worried about their date night. She was expecting a full body experience, if you know what I mean, so I said I'd take a look in my spell book to see if I couldn't help the poor fella out. The ghost sniggered behind her, and she threw a warning look over her shoulder. I mean, usually what that book comes up with is nonsense, but it had a surprising amount of information on the dead. So, I flipped through until I found a spell I thought I could customise into something that would work, except after the ritual, the guy doubles over like he ate a week-old pie from the market. Said he could feel his corpse wake up, which, incidentally, was buried at the mill after a bad case of plague almost a century ago. Those two never left the mill, you see. He still works there, watching the mechanism or something like that. So, where was I? Gretchen rubbed her chin, then held a finger up. Right, we hightail it to the mill to make sure Mrs Ed doesn't get eaten by Ed's earthly leavings, and that's when we run into these boneheads. Gretchen jerked her thumb over her shoulder and cleared her throat. The magistrate looked bored half to death by her rambling. And she bit her lip, wondering how to proceed. Not versed in the laws of the land, she scrambled for some kind of reasonable defence. Now, I want it noted, she pointed toward the sheriff who was scribbling in a ledger, that I hand on heart swear I did not exhume that body. That thing crawled right out of the ground itself. Zombies are about as sharp as a limp fish, but their strength is really rather remarkable. It could smell us inside and was circling the mill trying to figure out how to get in. With no mind to my own safety, I hatched a plan to get it inside, so I could douse it with a concoction to render it harmless against Edgewater's citizens. That's right. And after doing so, I thought the only responsible thing to do was to take it back to my place until I could make it a permanent fix. Gretchen heaved a deep breath and smiled, impressed with her story. Her face fell when the magistrate snorted. Are you quite done? No. Gretchen held her hand up to buy precious seconds in which to think. There had to be more. Something that would exonerate her. I had no intent on raising that zombie. Therefore, I shouldn't be held accountable for its existence. The magistrate rolled his eyes and puffed out his cheeks. Madam... You have confessed to raising the dead, which is a crime in this kingdom. Furthermore, instead of alerting the authorities to this abomination, you sought to destroy the evidence. The charges of grave robbing stand, and I shall add another count of obstruction of justice. But what about Ed? Gretchen waved her arms. Haven't you listened to a word I said? The magistrate snorted. Well, I don't see this Ed here, do I? I wasn't born yesterday. 
and if you think some ridiculous story about a ghost not transforming on Halloween would sway me... A whitish blur barrelled in through the thatched roof, and Gretchen took a hasty step back. Ed stopped mid-flight as he saw the party, and hovered over the magistrate as he cast a look over the room. "'We've been looking everywhere,' he admonished Gretchen. "'Searched almost every building in Edgewater. "'Now what is this?' "'The magistrate stood with his hands on his hips, "'his face burning with outrage. "'Warehouse or no, this is a court of law, "'and I won't stand for this kind of interruption.' "'Gretchen rubbed the bridge of her nose and spoke up. "'Your worshipness, Ed. Ed, your worshipness.' "'The magistrate circled around the ghost, "'holding his cap to his head as he craned his neck to stare up at him. "'A ghost? On tonight of all nights?' Gretchen squawked in frustration and stamped her foot. This is the rightful owner of the corpse, who gave me permission to use my magic on him. Isn't that right, Ed? The ghost drifted down and frowned. What is going on? That old fusspot, Gretchen pointed at the magistrate, is bent on stretching my neck on trumped-up charges. And those vermin, she glared at Reginald and the others, were more than happy to throw me under the cart to save their temporary skins. The warehouse was silent and Gretchen's breathing rang in her ears. She wasn't out of harm's way yet, she reminded herself, and a pathetic groan escaped her mouth. Is what she says true? The magistrate pointedly ignored Gretchen's outburst and directed the question at Ed. Yes, Ed's eyes darted to the handcart. That body is mine. Well, it was, anyhow. I sought a remedy from the witch, and things went terribly wrong. But he hastened to add. She did everything she could to put it right. Without her, my best could have... He shrugged. Well, I'm not sure dead is the right word, but it seems we are both suffering with the same affliction. The magistrate's brow furrowed, and he rubbed his bristly chin. I should think the law would concede ownership of one's body to the person in question. He shrugged at the sheriff. But I doubt a case like this has been rigorously tested on merit. Without the means to prove or disprove this man's claims... "'Necromancy is illegal,' the sheriff squeaked. "'Surely that counts for something?' "'Laws are put in place for good reason,' the magistrate nodded. "'But taking into account this man, "'ghost's solicitation of the witch's services, "'I cannot in good conscience condemn her at this time. "'I will need to seek counsel with the Crown over these.' "'A watchman by the cart cried out "'and held a bloodied hand to his chest. "'The bulge in the handcart was moving.' and the clicking of teeth audible over the exclamations. "'Oh, here we go,' Gretchen said, and rolled her eyes. "'If you'd just let us get on with our business, I could have had that thing subdued by now. "'Will he become one of them?' The magistrate's voice was strained. The other watchmen backed away from the cart, wary of meeting the same fate as their companion. "'Goodness, no.' Gretchen snapped her fingers at the sheriff and stepped closer to the lurching sack. It would take power well above my pay grade to raise a zombie of that calibre. But given an opportunity, that thing will chew through an entire village. My pouch, if you would. The magistrate backed toward the door, and his voice faltered as he called out, I hereby release this woman until such time as charges can be brought. Be a good man and give her what she wants, Sheriff. Chapter 6 With a nod from his superior, a watchman brought Gretchen her infinity pouch while she kept a facade of purpose on her face. She had no idea what would put down a zombie other than purple velvet essence, and that vial was long since empty. Perhaps a sleeping draught would do the job. She only usually prescribed a few drops per night. But if she used the lot it may be enough to keep those teeth from snapping until she got it back to her cottage. If it didn't work, Gretchen wondered if she may have to let Reginald smash the zombie's brains to bits. After fetching the corked bottle and securing the pouch to her belt, Gretchen stepped toward the burlap sack and took a reassuring breath. Neither the watchman nor the corporeal ghost made any move to render assistance, but Ed drifted closer, his face twisted with concern. "'How are you doing there, Ed?' Gretchen glanced between his remains and apparition. A little queasy. He held a hand to his middle. You won't hurt it, will you? I'll only put this guy to sleep so we can get him back to the cottage. Don't worry, my spellbook will come up with something. Ed didn't look all that reassured. 
and Gretchen puffed out her cheeks before closing the distance between her and the handcart. The sack jostled, and a sickening sound of joints popping back into place caused the hairs on Gretchen's neck to stand on end. Ripping the cork from the sleeping potion with her teeth, she stood as far as she could from the perimeter of the cart and leaned closer to splash the mix over the stinking bundle. It spasmed, convulsions almost upsetting the cart, then stilled with a rumbling sound. Is that, Reginald stuck his head over Gretchen's shoulder, is that thing snoring? I hope so, Gretchen snorted. I gave it enough of my famous sleeping draught to put an elephant into a coma. You'll be taking that body with you. The sheriff approached and Gretchen turned to arch an eyebrow at him. You don't want to keep it as evidence? She grinned. It would sure save me the trouble of having to bury it in the morning. The sheriff scowled and folded his arms. I'll have it collected by one of my men in the morning. If you don't produce the body, the magistrate will hear of it. Gretchen shook her head and glanced at the cart. When Carl moved over to grab the handles, she narrowed her eyes at Reginald. Reginald shrugged. Well, there's still the matter of the double distilled brew you mentioned. You think I'm going to welcome you to my home after the crap you just pulled? She jerked her thumb at the sheriff. You guys really have some nerve. Ted hefted a coil over to the cart and began winding it over the sack to hold it in place. You could always push it home yourself? The ruts are only deep enough to break your ankles and... Fine, Gretchen snapped. Have it your way. But if you think you hooligans can start swinging off the furniture after a few drams, you have another thing coming. Gretchen stormed out of the warehouse, not bothering to wait for the cart to catch up. The night air was cool against her face, and she hoped it would clear her hot head of all nights for those kinds of shenanigans. She should never have agreed to help Ed out. Deciding against flying back to her cottage, mostly to avoid an awkward takeoff in front of her company, she stomped off through a green field toward the road leading to her cottage. The moon hung heavy in the night sky. The timing was perfect to set her summoning, though she didn't know if her state of mind was conducive to that kind of magic. Are you all right? Ed breezed up beside her. My sincerest apologies. If I'd have known how much trouble this would have caused. Forget about it, Ed. Gretchen scrubbed a hand over her face. I should have known. Trouble comes with the territory. They continued in silence across the field and soon arrived at the well-worn road leading toward her cottage. Behind them, the corporeal ghosts had broken into a bawdy bar song and Gretchen tried not to listen too closely to the lyrics. The fools must have thought they were untouchable after their brush with the law, but Gretchen thought an arrest for noise pollution had some merit. She caught sight of Bess in her periphery, drifting across neat rows of newly planted cabbages, and frowned at Ed. This has really rattled her, huh? Not materialising? Ed shrugged. That would be worrisome enough. Those buffoons have always made Bess wary. And my corpse, well... He sighed. Do you two enjoy being ghosts? Gretchen winced at the words and cursed her lack of tact. What I mean to ask is, do we want to cross over? A smile tugged at Ed's lips. Contrary to what you living may think, we know nothing of what waits for us on the other side. Do you want to die? Gretchen screwed her face up and eyed him askance. No. And you have years yet to live, Ed chortled. Imagine existing on the precipice of a great void, a hair's breadth away from blinking out of this world. Our lives may be dull in this form, but I'm one of the lucky ones. Gretchen followed Ed's gaze to Bess and could understand why he felt that way. She was bending her mind to question Ed on any unfinished business they had when she saw her cottage ahead, the window bright with the glow of lanterns. Certain she had doused them before leaving earlier, she picked up the pace. Is something the matter? Ed drifted ahead of her. Someone's in my house, Gretchen growled. And if I stand any chance of surprising them, I better get ahead of those yodelling nincompoops. Ed didn't reply and instead shot off toward the cottage. Gretchen glanced at Bess, who remained a respectable distance away, but had slowed her approach and held a hand over her mouth. Gretchen was tempted to go console the poor woman, but knew that while Ed would probably scare the pants off whoever was lurking in her house, it would be up to her to apprehend them. Blood pounded in Gretchen's ears as she closed the distance, and she reefed the rickety gate open before storming up to her door. None of her windows appeared broken, 
and reckoning that she'd left the door unlocked again, she fumbled with her pouch to yank her broomstick out. Hefting it over her shoulder, she bumped the solid door with her hip and sprang into her kitchen with a cry. Gretchen! Nora frowned over a cup of tea and her eyes flickered to Ed. Put that broom down before you take someone's eye out and sit down. Seems like you have a story to tell. Gretchen blinked and leaned her broom by the door. I don't think so. Ignoring her friend, she moved into the kitchen and fetched the key to her pantry. There was a bottle of witch's brew with her name on it, and she thought she might scream if anyone else asked for an explanation of the night's events. Tell me, Gretchen thumped a full bottle and two glasses in front of Nora. What are you doing here? Did the Baron give you a free pass for the night? Gretchen regretted the words as soon as she said them and sank to a chair beside her. Both her and Jürgen had been treading lightly around Nora as she recovered from the debacle with the mirror, and Gretchen feared the enchantment had taken the puff from her normally turbulent sails permanently. Gretchen Mirkwood, Nora snapped. With a tongue like yours, it's no wonder trouble finds you. I came here to see a dear friend, and instead I find a burned-out salt circle with the stench of dark magic about it and the door left unlocked. I was just sitting here trying to put myself in your incorrigible shoes so I could fathom just where you might have gotten to. Gretchen smirked and her friend's face went an ugly shade of purple. If she'd known earlier that belligerence would have snapped Nora out of her funk, she would have saved herself weeks of irritation. I, uh, Ed hovered in the kitchen rubbing his hands together. I should go get Bess. Go ahead, Gretchen waved toward the door then poured two good measures of witch's brew. And make sure those idiots don't lose any body parts on the way in. Body parts! Nora thumped the table with her fist, causing her teacup to rattle on its saucer. What have you done to that poor ghost? I've never seen the like. You'll tell me what's going on before you get arrested. Too late for that. Gretchen threw back the glass and groaned at the raw burn down her throat. The magistrate put the case in the too hard basket, which leaves me with the small problem of keeping a zombie subdued until dawn. Nora opened her mouth to speak but all she managed was a strangled cry. Gretchen rubbed the bridge of her nose and heard Reginald and his buddies approach, singing a much lewder song. The handcart crunched the gravel outside the door, and before Gretchen could give them any directions, Carl heaved the snoozing zombie through the front door, its sides scraping against the doorframe. Zombies! Nora screeched. And that lot? What was it exactly you planned to do with them? Gretchen bit back a laugh at the look of indignation on Nora's face and gathered another bottle of witch's brew and more glasses. After refilling Nora's glass and shooing the riffraff into her living room, she leaned against her side table and searched for the most concise way to explain the strange set of circumstances. Ed and Bess drifted down through the ceiling and Gretchen waved her glass at them. Ed and his wife Bess here ran into some trouble materialising tonight – I told Ed I would take a look at my spell book and see if I couldn't help him out. Nora groaned and buried her face in her hands. Ye of little faith, Gretchen muttered. So, I couldn't find anything that fit exactly, but with some tweaking. You raised his corpse instead, Nora finished. You really are a nitwit sometimes, Gretchen. Nice to see you finally berating me, Gretchen huffed. Makes for a pleasant change from all the moping you've been doing. But I had my own plans and I didn't have time to do an exhaustive investigation on the issue. I mean, whoever heard of this kind of problem? And Ed here only wanted to... Gretchen's face coloured, and she smiled sheepishly at Bess. Nora's brows furrowed as she considered the couple, and she rubbed her chin. Reginald was telling some kind of story while standing on the coffee table, and Gretchen glared at him. She really would need to give them the bum's rush before too long, or risk having most of her furniture busted before morning. He caught her eye and rolled his eyes before stepping to the floor, then sauntered over to Nora and wound an arm around her shoulder. Nora, darling. Get your hand off me, you damnable drunkard! Nora swatted his hand away and curled her lip. How did this lot become involved? Needed some muscle, Gretchen shrugged. Not even Jürgen was willing to put up with their kind tonight. Promised them a bottle of double distilled witch's brew to get that mess back here. The others raised their glasses and cheered at the mention of liquor. Gretchen shook her head and smacked her lips. Let me get this straight. Nora took a small sip from her glass. Your spellbook has necromancy rituals in its inventory. 
and this has come to the attention of the authorities. Gretchen, if this gets back to the academy... Confiscation at best. Gretchen hadn't considered that. And if they hear I used it... Your licence will be forfeit, Nora finished. I'm so sorry. Ed wrung his hands, worry etching his eyes. If I'd have known, I would never have troubled you. I'm a big girl, Ed. The Academy doesn't frighten me. Let's just hope that magistrate doesn't bother looking into it with his city buddies. How was it that this magistrate let you go? Nora asked. The issue of ownership, Ed piped up. That body is mine, and I gave consent for the ritual. Not to mention that thing taking a bite out of one of the watchmen, Gretchen chuckled. I'll be sure to pay a visit to the poor fella in the morning. I have no doubt that wound will fester. A lull in the conversation and the corporal ghosts falling blessedly quiet left the sound of the zombie snoring by the table. Nora's eyes widened and she stood to inspect the bundle. Sleeping, she exclaimed. Who would have thought that was possible? Chapter 7 Gretchen refilled her glass and considered her overstuffed cottage and its inebriated inhabitants. She couldn't be bothered kicking out Reginald and his crew, and Ed and Bess were being good sports under Nora's incessant questioning. It left Gretchen with her own thoughts, and she hadn't plucked up the motivation to seek out her spellbook to seek a remedy for the situation. Not while the zombie was still snoring anyhow. It would be another year before she could set another summoning for her great-aunt Esme. After so many questions nearly being answered in the Tooth Fairy's realm, she yearned to put the rattling of her aunt's ghost to rest. It was so close she could taste it, or perhaps that was only the witch's brew. It was Aunt Esme's recipe, after all. Nora set her glass down carefully and spoke with a slight slur. But surely you can recall being buried, without the proper rites being adhered to. The memories are, Bess swallowed, murky, but you needn't trouble yourself, really. They don't want to pass on, Nora. Gretchen propped her face with her hands. That wasn't the point. Nora blinked, then shrugged. Then what are we to do with the corpse? The way I see it, so long as that thing keeps snoring, we shouldn't tamper with it. My spellbook said the magic would wear off come morning. Gretchen pushed herself to her feet, with her fists planted on the table to keep steady. Now, you folks are all going to have to keep yourselves entertained. I have magic to see to. What? Nora snorted. In your state? Like as not to set the house ablaze. Everything is in readiness, Gretchen said, waggling her eyebrows. There's plenty of moonlight left. All I need to do is activate the portal. Portal? Nora choked on the word. Now that's worse than foolhardy. If you're doing what I think you're doing, Gretchen Mirkwood, then I'm leaving. Gretchen raised her eyebrow. In your state? I'd give you maybe a mile before you fell off your broom. That's if you could get into the air at all. She's gone, Nora said through gritted teeth. You really need to give this up. The woman chooses not to answer your call and I can't say I blame her. If she can really see through the veil, I'm sure she's as frustrated as everyone else with your obsession over her. Ed and Bess shared worried glances and Gretchen ran a tongue over her teeth. Well... You know what they say about opinions. Everyone has one. But I seem to recollect that I didn't invite any of you over here tonight, so forgive me if I'm not playing the part of hostess to your liking. Nora flinched at that, and Gretchen closed her eyes. She knew Nora was only looking out for her, and after all the failed attempts at solving her aunt's disappearance, her friend always had her back. Gretchen told herself it was only for her sake that Nora tried to dissuade her. I'm sorry. Gretchen sighed and pulled her lips up into a reassuring smile at Ed and Bess, who had moved away from the table. It's been a trying night, but I get one shot at this a year. Let me humour myself. Nora scraped her chair back and stood, her face slack, and pressed her lips together. Fine, but I would think given your luck so far, it will be for naught. Carl was watching with open interest from the sofa, and Gretchen narrowed her eyes and pointed. You lot can stay right there. I've got one more bottle of witch's brew left, and I'm not above clobbering you over the head with it if you pull any stunts. The pranksters shared an amused look between them, and Carl tipped his glass toward her with a nod. Taking a deep breath, Gretchen turned to fetch a basket from the kitchen when Bess shrieked, turning on her heel and almost losing her balance in the process. 
Gretchen followed her gaze to the handcart, where the zombie sack bulged disconcertingly under its rope constraints. How much sleeping tonic did you administer? Nora's voice sounded wary. A fatal dose. Gretchen scrubbed a hand over her face. Under normal circumstances. The rope strained as the zombie popped itself back together in a series of sickening sounds and the handcart jostled. A hush fell over the others who stood to watch on and Gretchen moved to elbow her way past them to her spell book, which lay still on her desk. She opened the book to the middle, hoping the passages she called for earlier would still be there, but all the pages were blank. OK, I'm in a bit of a pickle here and I need something to put down a zombie pronto. She held her palm down on the page, hoping to impress the gravity of the situation. Her book let out a high-pitched whining sound, and Gretchen's face screwed up. She wondered why she was bothering with it anyhow. She may have some more sedatives lying around, and anything that came from the book would likely take time to prepare. Time she didn't have if the exclamations behind her back were anything to go by. The whining continued and the sound rose up and down and changed notes like some kind of deranged harpsichord. Gretchen covered her ears and stood back, hoping whatever fancy had come over the book would play out before too long. Gretchen! Nora cried out. Do you have some sage? Anything to burn in its general direction? Gretchen's thoughts swam. Sage. If a sleeping brew wasn't enough to put that mess down, how on earth did she think sage would work? Her spellbook picked up an eerily upbeat tune, and she turned to frown at her friend. The handcart overturned, and the sack lurched forward, free of the ropes. An arm burst from the burlap and smacked on the flagstones, trying to get purchase to pull itself forward. The strange music filled Gretchen's ears, as hypnotic as it was hideous, and the movement of the corpse seemed almost in time with the tune. "'Where's a shovel?' Reginald roared. "'I say we put this thing down once and for all!' Gretchen glanced back at her spellbook. The pages remained blank, yet a calm sense of clarity gripped her. The tome was doing something, and she had borne witness to its irregular waves of genius before. Reginald grabbed a poker by the fire, and Gretchen rushed forward to intercept him. Stop, she screeched. Everybody stand back. Bess had already moved to cling to the ceiling, and the drunken louts watching on stumbled back to give Gretchen room. Nora opened her mouth to speak, but Gretchen held up a finger in warning. You hear that? She pitched her voice to be heard over the cacophony. No teeth. It's putting itself back together, but I don't think it's hungry. Gretchen watched with morbid fascination as the zombie burst clear of the sack and its twisted limbs cracked into place. It moved to the rhythm of the spellbook's beat, yet its jaw remained still, exposed in a macabre rictus. Is that thing... dancing? Nora shouted into her ear. Looks like it. Gretchen held her hips and chuckled. Not exactly what I had in mind, but so long as it's keeping its teeth to itself. The zombie climbed to its feet with a wiggle of its hips and lifted its arms up. With a sway, it turned in a circle while thumping its feet on the floor. The mood was infectious, and Gretchen smirked as she realised she was bobbing in time to the corpse's moves. The corporeal ghosts burst out laughing and Reginald draped an arm around her shoulder. Setting the mood, huh? He drawled, swinging the poker in time with the music. Strange tastes, I must admit. Get off it, Gretchen disentangled herself from his grip and stepped into the kitchen. Ed pressed against the far wall, his eyes wide, though he didn't seem ill like the last time his corpse was on the move. Are you sure? He ventured and swallowed. I have no idea. Gretchen waved her arms and collected her basket from the counter. But if it's working, I'm not complaining. It's supposed to be some kind of house party, isn't it? That lot can keep an eye on things while I go about my own business. Do you mind if we... It's just that... His lip curled. Sure, come on outside. Maybe your ghostly proximity might help move things along. Gretchen beckoned to Nora and unlatched the back door to her garden. The night remained clear and she appreciated the earthy smells from her vegetable patch. Her home was not designed to accommodate so many people. With a grin up at the heavy moon, she stepped out toward the clear space beyond the rows of beans, where a circle of quartz glowed in the darkness. Let me take a look at this. Nora walked ahead of her and circled the stones at a respectable distance. With a sniff of the air, 
she gave a tight nod and stepped back to a bench Aunt Esme used to favour in the summer. It was the main reason she'd chosen that part of the garden to hold the ritual. What is it you're doing exactly? Ed asked. Questions, questions, Gretchen grumbled. She fetched out her aunt's favourite necklace from the basket nestled in a scarf she'd knitted for Gretchen as a child. Calling my kin from across the grave, seeking answers to her demise, Ed recoiled as if struck and looked back toward the cottage, likely wondering which company he'd rather keep. Bess clung to him in silence, and he patted her hand reassuringly. Don't you think that's a bit reckless? Given what has already transpired, wouldn't our presence only muddy... Have you learned nothing about me during the course of the night, Ed? Gretchen guffawed. Recklessness is my nature. Trouble is my middle name. Or at least it should be. My regard for safety is rather lacking, and... You're drunk. Ed's voice was firm, and his level stare brooked no nonsense. You said yourself that meddling with the dead isn't your strong suit. Gretchen scowled. She'd been starting to like Ed. She swung around to Nora, who looked as though she'd put the words in Ed's mouth herself, and belched. There was one thing that always goaded her on. People telling her not to do something. She decided her current set of circumstances was no exception. With a huff, she stepped toward the circle and kneeled on wobbly legs to arrange her aunt's keepsakes and the scarf that was their shared connection into the ring. She felt the power of the arranged items stir magic within the circle, thankfully prepared ahead of time with less of her usual heedlessness. Her eyelids drooped, and as she sought a mindless trance, she heard a banging coming from the back door. Turning with a growl, her eyes settled on Ted, who was swinging around in the zombie's embrace, laughing wildly as his companions watched through the window. "'Take that inside, will you?' she called. I don't want to know what will happen if that thing gets out of earshot of the music. Ted's face blanched at that, and Gretchen wondered for a moment who was leading as their feet moved in concert. Rather forcefully, he yanked the corpse back inside and the sound drowned out as Reginald shut the door behind them. Now, Gretchen muttered to herself, where was I? Blinking to clear her mind, she checked that Ed and Nora were still out of the way and turned her attention back to the circle. She touched the quartz with her fingertips and felt the thrum of energy inside them. Drawing a deep breath through her nose, she banished thoughts of the circus her night had become and pictured her aunt's wizened face, one whose features looked more or less the same for as long as Gretchen could remember. Where are you? she pleaded under her breath. Was it the spiders, the hives? I just want some closure, to know for sure that your soul is at rest. Gretchen screwed her eyes shut, fighting a wave of grief and fear that once again her calls would fall on deaf ears. Seconds dragged and her shoulders drooped. She was too ashamed to lift her head to face Nora's, I told you so, look, and a hot tear slid down her cheek. Then a shock wave of energy burst up through her fingertips and blasted her backward. She landed on her backside with a grunt on the dewy grass and risked a peek through a cracked eyelid. The circle glowed with a brilliant white light, but along with her own dismissal, the relics inside the circle had likewise been cast out. Gretchen shielded her eyes against the light, and an impending sense of doom settled in her gut. She couldn't begin to guess what kind of madness lay in that bridge to the other side. Chapter 8 Gretchen! Nora rushed around the circle and crouched beside her. Are you all right? I think so. She held a hand to her head, which pounded like the hammering of a thousand drums. One mighty backlash, though. Wind picked up around the pair, and Nora's eyes darted around the garden. What have you unleashed? Like I know, Gretchen groaned. It was the same as every other year. I thought the scarf would be fitting, and the necklace should have worked for sure. I found it in the back of a closet last spring in a jar of dried dragonflies of all places. Could you believe that? And... Hush. Nora squeezed her shoulder. Do you hear that? Gretchen strained to listen over the pounding inside her skull, and the shrieking coming from the circle sounded closer to the mewling of a babe than a vengeful spirit. Gretchen leaned to get a look around Nora's bulk and blinked in confusion at the scene in front of her. Ed and Bess hovered at the circle's edge, wearing rapt expressions. The shriek burbled into something less outraged, 
and ethereal tears slid freely down Ed's cheeks. Gretchen nudged her friend. Look. The pair watched as wordless communication passed between the ghost couple and the presence in the light. Unbidden emotion welled in Gretchen's gut as she fathomed what was taking place. Only a babe could make such a wide variety of incoherent sound, and there was parental love shining from the eyes of the couple. The plague. Gretchen had never thought to ask if the couple had children. Leaning closer to Nora, she held a hand to her chest and let go of her own grief in the face of something so primal. The wind died down around them, and the white light settled into something more translucent. Oh, Gretchen, Nora croaked. Those poor souls. Gretchen wiped a stray tear from her eye and reached for her friend's hand. I think they needed this more than I did. Ed and Bess stood together, captivated by the long overdue reunion, until Gretchen tugged at Nora's sleeve. Come on, let's give them some privacy, huh? Nora nodded wordlessly, and Gretchen steered her back toward the kitchen. Even with the disarray inside, she fancied a cup of tea to soothe her head, perhaps with some feverfew and peppermint. The sluggishness of liquor seemed scoured from her veins, but she felt every one of her years as she swung a kettle over the hearth. The strange music continued in the living room, piercing like daggers in her brain, and Gretchen avoided looking toward her house guests. She'd already reconciled the probability of broken furniture by the time the ghosts had puffed into a cloud of vapour with the sunrise. Do you suppose? Nora gave a shake of her head as she reached for a fresh tea set. No matter. It's only, why would they remain here when they have a little one to watch over beyond this plane? I'm not sure that's a matter for the living to understand. Gretchen rubbed her temple and reached for the jar of dried herbs she kept on hand for headaches. But so long as... She made a strangled sound. Hmm? Nora turned to look at Gretchen and frowned. You think they may cross? Thumping the herbs down on the counter, Gretchen trailed back outside to check. Nothing had noticeably changed, except Bess had her hands in the light and their expressions had softened. Gretchen stepped closer tentatively, not wanting to spoil the moment, but Ed caught sight of her and waved. It's our babe! He sounded almost giddy. We never knew. That is, Bess was heavy with child when... It took a few seconds to make sense in Gretchen's mind. If Bess had perished from the plague, her unborn child would have survived her, if only for a few minutes. Gretchen could think of nothing worthier to deem unfinished business. So, you both hung around? Gretchen licked her lips. To protect the baby? Ed only shrugged. I died first. All I remember is thinking how I could possibly leave Bess to such a fate. Nora moved closer to the circle and sniffed at the air. Have you reconsidered, Ed, about wanting to pass on? Bess, who'd seemed oblivious to their presence, snapped her head toward Nora. Do you think we could? Nora took a deep breath and planted her fists on her hips. There is magic beyond our reckoning behind this. Power that took no heed of a witch's intent. Used her carefully designed circle to bring forth that which is dear to you. She shook her head, as though trying to fathom it. If this was meant to be your bridge to the other side... It isn't Gretchen's magic that commands it. Meddling may only compromise the link. What should we do? Ed looked as eager as his wife and leaned closer to Nora while keeping his hand absently touching the light. Nora glanced at Gretchen, who shrugged. It was well above her pounding head and she was relieved she didn't have to touch the circle of quartz again. Gretchen's spellbook is occupied. Nora chewed her lip. Though I doubt it would give much counsel on such a thing. Can you... Move into the light? Ed and Bess shared a look, and an unspoken decision was reached between them. Ed moved to test the theory first, but Bess held him back with a hand pressed to his chest. The hairs on the back of Gretchen's neck prickled, and she took a step backward against a sense of power building in the surrounding air. Bess's hand hadn't left the circle, but as her arm disappeared into the light, its glow shone brilliantly. Nora moved back, and Gretchen reached to drag her clear of the maelstrom as wind swirled at their feet. Gretchen could only see Bess's hand, interlaced with Ed's, but he didn't seem alarmed as he followed his wife into the unknown abyss. When the couple passed from sight, the light became blinding, and Gretchen held up her arm to shield her face. Wind howled in her ears, and she clamped her pointed hat down to keep from losing it to the storm. The energy in the air surged, 
and Gretchen thought her head may explode. Then a blast pushed her backwards. She landed flat on her back and grunted when Nora landed on her. For precious seconds, Gretchen felt no pain, too shocked to acknowledge her earthly limitations, completely in awe at the breadth of power. Then it burned through her, and she drew a ragged breath, screwing her nose up at the smell of singed hair. Did it work? Gretchen nudged her friend so she could sit up. Nora coughed and rolled her bulk off Gretchen's middle. Her spectacles hung from her face, bent out of shape, but beyond her the quartz circle was empty. They did it! Gretchen pushed to her feet with a wince and stepped closer. They actually did it. I did it. I'm like the ghost whisperer or something. Wait until the word about this gets around. Those stuffy old hags at the academy. Have you forgotten about the zombie in there? Nora pointed to the back door. You'll say nothing about this, you fool, or risk the full weight of the academy's ire. Gretchen blinked, the glory of the moment stolen, and rubbed her lower back where she'd landed on an errant pebble. Always the good stuff, she muttered, never any credit where it's due. Nora bent her spectacles back into place and picked up Aunt Esme's necklace and scarf. I'm sorry, I know how much you wanted to speak to her, Gretchen shrugged. There's always next year. The muted sound of the dreadful music in her cottage stopped and followed by an undignified shriek. Gretchen's eyes widened and she sprang toward the back door, cursing herself for not considering the consequences for Ed's earthly remains. Nora was hot on her heels, and when Gretchen skidded to a halt in her living room, she held her hand to her mouth. Carl, Ted and Alfred stood on her sofa while Murray wielded the fire poker. Reginald stood with his back pressed to the wall with his nose screwed up against the smell. The rancid stench of decay filled the room, and Ed's corpse lay sprawled across her rug completely inanimate. It made a certain kind of sense given Ed's exit from the world and the magic she had invoked on his ghost unwinding. Mulligan stalked out from the bedroom with a yawn, not sparing a glance at any of the inhabitants, and stopped by the corpse to give it a cursory sniff. I wouldn't if I were you, flea bag, Gretchen warned. Smells bad enough now. I don't want to imagine what kind of gas it would conjure in your gut. Mulligan gave her an unimpressed look and the corporeal ghosts took a collective breath of relief. Her feline companion glared at the intruders, then turned to saunter back to bed. I think it's all over, guys. Gretchen's nose twitched, and whatever magic was holding that together has gone with it. Murray dropped the fire poker and held a hand to his belly. Reginald gave the corpse a wide berth and moved toward the door. You fixed it? Carl stepped down from the sofa. Did you manage to get Ed a body? He's gone. Nora's voice was quiet. Best too, passed over. Silence hung thick in the air as the men stared at Nora with mouths agape. Gretchen rubbed the bridge of her nose, knowing it would unleash a barrage of questions she was in no mood to answer. It wasn't our doing, so don't go getting ideas. Reginald found his voice first, though it was hoarse. Lucky buggers. Gretchen left the crowd to process the news and tried again to prepare a pot of tea. Her head still thumped, more so after the blast, and the kettle sounded unreasonably loud in the aftermath of the night's noise. After preparing a tea tray, she carried it out to the table and sat slumped while Nora poured. You lot can get that body out to the garden, Nora barked as she waved at Ted and Alfred. You've had more than enough hospitality for the night. Party's over. Gretchen expected them to complain, but a morose feeling had settled among them understandable given their lingering presence in a world which had long since left them behind. Murray began setting upturned items right as Ted and Alfred bundled the corpse back in the cart. Even Reginald picked up some fragments of a broken vase in silence. Gretchen took a sip of tea, savouring the warmth under her fingertips, and closed her eyes with a sigh. Thanks for the booze, Carl cleared his throat. I think it might be time for us to be on our way. Gretchen gave a tight smile and nodded, watching them push the handcart out the front door as they left. Nora stood to return Gretchen's spellbook back to its bindings and gave Mulligan a scratch behind the ears as he reappeared in the living room. The scruffy feline jumped to the kitchen table and nuzzled Gretchen's cheek. For once, it seemed, her familiar was acutely aware of her emotional state and his affection was comforting, even if she was bone-weary 
and felt like she'd taken a tumble from a steep mountain. All in all, Nora sat and stirred some sugar into her cup, I think a good deed was done this night, zombies notwithstanding. Gretchen scratched Mulligan under the chin and smiled. You know what? I think you're right. Gretchen held her dressing gown close as she swung her door open with clenched teeth. The sheriff stood by the cart with a scowl. Can I help you? She glared. I'm here to collect the evidence. His nose wrinkled. And to inquire after the owner. I should like to question him further on his claims. Gretchen sighed with resignation. She had the feeling the man wasn't going to let go, even if the magistrate had buckled. He passed on, last night. Gretchen pressed her lips together and refrained from rubbing her temple. Her head's thumping hadn't ceased with the few hours sleep she'd managed. How convenient. A nasty smile spread over his mouth. I shall have to pass that on in my report. You can verify it with the others. Gretchen hoped the ghosts would have her back. And his worship heard Ed's testimony himself. Good luck trying to get that old coot to change his mind. I could always pass this on to your superiors. The sheriff's eyes blazed. Perhaps they may take the matter of necromancy seriously. Gretchen gritted her teeth and bunched her fists at her sides. It would be just her luck to lose her spellbook and her licence. She was sure Cordelia would like to get a good look at the family heirloom. She'd so snubbed after hearing what secrets it held. Go right ahead, she snarled. Send it to the vice-chancellor herself if you like. But the next time one of your kin falls ill, don't even think about knocking on my door seeking a remedy. He held her steely glare for a few moments before huffing and taking the handcart in tow. Gretchen watched him as he rounded the corner, waiting for him to waver. But he showed no sign of second thoughts. Damn! Gretchen slammed the door, then winced at the sound exploding in her head. I'm going to have to come up with something good to get out of this one. With a mind to fixing something for her head, Gretchen headed back to the kitchen when her eye caught on her spellbook on her desk. Without even its laces bound, it was a dangerous commodity to leave lying around. With an irritated cluck, she moved to remedy the situation and mused on how her spellbook became versed in being the Pied Piper of Zombies. She smoothed her hand over the cover and it gave a slight stretch at her touch. I, uh, I haven't thanked you for last night. That really was something with the dancing and all. She thumbed the cover open absently and chewed her lip. Really saved my bacon, again. Though I suppose I could argue it was you who gave me the... Gretchen shook her head and thought better of the sentiment. She gave the page a pat and reached for the leather bindings. A good deed was done, in any case, full of surprises, as ever. The tome gave a happy chirp, and just as Gretchen was about to close it, a tidy scrawl etched onto the page. Is that... Gretchen narrowed her eyes, following the neat lines as they appeared and recognising both the handwriting and some of the ingredients her aunt used most. She'd never seen the actual recipe, but from what little she could remember. Aunt Esme's famous headache tonic. I've been asking for that recipe for years. I thought it must have never been recorded properly. The book hummed and Gretchen hurried to fetch a clean sheet of parchment to jot the recipe down. As the ink dried, she considered the book's strange knowledge and rubbed her chin. Do you know where she is? Aunt Esme. The words disappeared from the page, and Gretchen thought it wouldn't answer. Then the word yes appeared in the centre of the page. Her breath caught in her throat and she clamped a hand to her chest. Can you tell me? she whispered. The spell book fell to silence and the page faded before showing a final response. Not yet. Thank you for joining me on this spooktacular journey through Halloween Date Night, Episode 6 of the Gretchen's Misadventures series. If you've been enchanted by Gretchen's whimsical escapades, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more enchanting readings and fantastical tales. Share your thoughts on this spooktacular misadventure or recommend your favourite fantasy reads in the comments below. Your insights are the magic that keeps this community thriving. If you're ready for more of Gretchen and her mystical escapades, give this video a thumbs up and hit the notification bell to stay updated on all things magical right here. Until our next adventure, may your books be filled with wonder 
and your days with magic. Happy reading. <laughs>